Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Keep Calm, It's Just a Snake podcast. Today we have an awesome, awesome guest. He's actually the first guest that we've had on that really does, uh, I think, exclusively or near exclusively uh, all boas and boa emperors, I think specifically. Uh, this is Noah's boas. He uh, does some really cool stuff. How are you doing today? Hey man, I'm doing good. How are you doing? Great. I'm um, always looking for it. I don't, uh, here in Colorado we're at, it's quite the ball python pit. So, um, there's, <laughs> there's not a whole lot going on with boas here other than like a couple people and they're, um, well, they're not quite chondro snobs, I should say, but they're kind of snobby <laughs> things. So Yeah. The ball pythons really own the industry still. I know. I was, I always like to say it's like the best and the worst thing to happen to the industry. Like it gets everyone yeah. excited for it and to jump in, but it's just meh. coming from the guy who was like a hundred something ball pythons, but hey, who's will be. um so how long have you uh how long have you been doing this um i mean i'm I'm one of those people that you know ever since i was like five years old as long as i can remember i've been super into reptiles you know grew up with steve Irwin kind of stuff yep um parents would never let me keep any obviously she you know my mom was super against it uh and then eventually i kind of you know forced my way into it you know made a deal get good grades get my first snake and uh i started with carpet pythons they were kind of like my first real uh attraction to snakes i guess like i just loved their their big muscly heads and stuff right. but um and i bred them for a little while but then i realized that i i hate carpet python babies so much <laughs> i mean <laughs> there's such a pain to get started they yeah. pee all over you like i would just get so annoyed with it so I kind of slowly ended up transitioning to boas because I was working with uh, Joe Consolini from JPC Boas for oh, cool. about four or five years. And then before that, I worked in a reptile shop here in Avon, Connecticut called Harrison Wonderland Pets. Um, I volu- I started volunteering there when I was like 12. Uh, Adam was like one of the people that really got me into it. And then Jeremy Turgeon ended up coming into the shop and I've known him since I was like 12 years old. So I've known all these people for a super long time and they helped like foster everything. Jeremy would take me to nerd and stuff. Now I get to see all the cool animals. So I've been really fortunate with like the people I've met along the way, but uh, yeah, that's about it. That's really cool. So <laughs> do you keep only boas at this point or cause I, I pretty yeah. much only ever see you post um, just post the boas. Yeah. I've got mostly BCIs. Uh, I've got some rainbow boas. Uh, my girlfriend has a pair of Dumerals boas we should be breeding next year. And then she has a pet tegu. I have a pet rhino iguana and a pet black rat snake, just because I like black rat snakes. But other than that, all boas. That's really cool. I was going to say, I know you don't like the carpet python babies, but if you ever tried breeding black rat snakes, I know they can be uh, little pistols when they're little ones. Yeah, they're fun, though. I like them. They are. They're, uh, really they're, cool. they're one of my favorite native snakes around here. And uh, I don't know. I just always wanted one. And uh, my friend down in North Carolina uh, had a some her friend had like an injured mother or something. And she ended up with a bunch of babies because she laid eggs and she was in you know captivity while she was healing. And so I grabbed one of those. Cool. That's really cool. Those are always really fun. I need to I, I like rat snakes, but I've I have trouble with all the different uh, locales and different species. Oh, so and many. Yeah. And, and I mean, no one ever agrees about who's what and what's what and <laughs> all sorts of that nonsense. But um, yeah, yeah. So getting back to bows, because honestly, that's what I want to like to talk to you more about, because I like bows too, and I want to learn some stuff. Um, how long have you been breeding bows? Um, oh, probably about eight, eight or nine years now wow that's really cool um yeah i was gonna say i don't know i don't think you do too many like you're not doing like big big productions of them i know you work with some pretty cool lines of stuff like i always see um the lava line which i'm assuming is just like a really cool line of coral albino but i'm not really sure yeah yeah pretty much um it's one of those like weird things that's kind of popped up in the the kraken line of stuff oh okay um, a lot of them we've figured out are kind of their own line of T positive too. Hmm. So a lot of them are like a visual T positive cow. So it's a T positive T negative animal. And it just really, really helps make the corals pop. 
but um, both started with Scott CV at CV Exotics in New Hampshire. And then Joe from JPC got a bunch of animals from him and started breeding that stuff. So that's how I sort of got into the corals. Cause when I first started working for Joe, I was still like heavy into carpets and like not really into boas. And then I saw, uh, well, first I saw a full striped boa and that's like when I was like, all right, I want that snake. (laughs) And then like, I I wasn't allowed to clean like the big stuff for a while. Like I was on like baby duty and stuff like that. And then eventually I worked my way up and got to the big stuff. And I saw like one of his like double dose lava line corals and I like lost my mind over it. Like I could not get enough. And so that's what really fueled my coral passion for sure. That's really cool. (laughs) Yeah. Is that mostly what you work with as far as like the BI, the imperators go? Um, coral is definitely my main focus. Uh, I've got a lot of Roswell stuff. I'm really into that. I like the, their patterns, obviously. And there's a, the groovy coral line, which originated with the Roswells. Um, I have one VPI IMG just because like those are absolutely insane. Like I feel like everybody needs a VPI IMG in their life. And uh, and then some like uh, ghost snow annery stuff like that moon glows. I really like working with those. Cool. Does that? Because um, I do basic just like coral line stuff, like a high pink color, but I don't do anything crazy. Um, yeah. Have you incorporated like the lava and the RLTs into moon glow or anything like that? Yes. So last. Oh yeah, I guess last season um, I bred a. Uh, Groovy Coral, Sun Glow, Roswell, Ladder Tail, Het Annery to a Lava Line, Kraken, Ghost, Het Cal. And I made some, I made one Moon Glow that had just like the tiniest little saddles all like they were just super, super thin. And she was like this weird green color. She was so freaking cool. <laughs> so we were thinking it was a super hypo Moon Glow, Roswell, Ladder Tail, but it was so hard to tell because there was just like nothing to really right. go off of on her. But I also made some like absolutely insane corals in that litter. And, and I did the groovy coral to lava cross the year before. So I have some two year olds and they're like absolutely nuts. Like I have never seen anything like some of them. Like one of the males has like purple and lavender on his tail. Like they're just so unique. And it takes them like a solid year usually before they really start like getting that coral color in. But those are the best ones. Like when they come out, I've noticed like when they come out looking really corally, they don't keep it as well or like it kind of fades a little bit. But when they come out looking kind of normal or they have this weird like pink hue to them, like those are the ones that are going to be top tier corals. That's awesome. So I thinking thinking back, I know a lot of the people that um, tune in are mostly ball python people. So we're probably talking a little bit over their heads at the moment. Um, (laughs) So we'll just wind that back a little bit. So you mostly work with the call line, which is the only true negative, true T negative line of albino in bow and broaders, correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. And then in there, there are a couple different specific lines. Like we hear about like lipstick a lot and we hear about mm-hmm. coral. Um, lipsticks have the more like defined sharp like lines and then coral usually have a lot of like high pink and high color to them. Right. So yeah. when you talk about the groovy coral, what exactly do you mean by groovy coral? Groovy coral is kind of uh, similar to lava, but it's a little more of like a, it's like a, at least the one I have, he's like a lighter pink, like almost like a creamier color as opposed to like that really intense high orange, high pink ones. Um, I think a lot of it just has to do, so like Roswell's originated from a uh, Suriname boa. Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of it, <clears throat> just has to do with crossing a Suriname boa to a BCI boa because people still do that and have done that in the past and it always makes a really really beautiful albino like either high contrast or coral so I think that's mostly where it originated from but it does pass down and breeding two of them together makes some really awesome stuff um so it's yeah that's it's just another line of coral basically that's really cool um and then for the lava stuff so the lava being another line of the um, coral albino, but you also said it's possibly a visual T pause. So could you go into a little bit of a little bit more detail into that? Yeah. So <clears throat> some of them 
like, uh, so I have a couple visual T positive, T negatives. Um, I have some that I suspect to be HET or visual T positives that are kind of like the, the normal or hypo, like it's not a visual T negative albino, the cow that, that you usually see. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's something that we've like kind of noticed, you know, within the last few years. So I'm trying to single it out as best as I can, but it's mixed in with cow so much. It's so hard to like, I guess, discern what just a normal T positive from this line, like a T positive albino would look like. Um, but when they, they come out, they kind of look ugly. They're like, look like this really washed out, like a lot of like that weird green color I was telling you about. And then they just kind of eventually pop out of nowhere. So everyone always gives me so much grief because they say like, I never saw corals. I never saw corals, but it's, I, I have to hold them back for at least a year before I feel comfortable selling it. One, because I don't want to sell somebody a coral for like the coral price and have it not coral. But I also don't want to sell something that I'm going to regret selling to, you know. Right. <laughs> so I always allow them for at least a year, sometimes longer, especially with this uh, this T positive lava stuff, because it it takes a year, year and a half, sometimes even two years before they really you see what they're going to turn into. Like that uh, moon glow that I was telling you about, I still have a a female that I fully intend on selling. But she's just starting to come into her color, and she was born June of last year. Oh wow. <clears throat> That's so But crazy. you still you can't really see it in pictures yet and like she hasn't really like gone into it but you can see that she's got that pink hue like the potential is like all there and some of her litter mates have already coraled up like crazy so I'm excited to see what she does for sure. That's really interesting. I wonder if that's like like I know the VPIs they will kind of really brighten up when they hit that kind of same size do you think that's just that weird like combo of like the t-paws and the call that does that where it's almost like an autogenic change where it just like hits a certain point and then it just kind of yeah i mean it's it seems like most of the corals do that whether it's lava groovy t-positive crack and whatever like it just seems like it's a it's a time like a waiting game for them Hmm. which like I personally love because like I want a snake that's going to look better and better as it gets older not like right. dull out because you know most of the call you know when you say call albino everyone thinks of, like just a yellow snake because a lot of them turn into that as an adult which is fine if that's what you want but like I like the really vibrant crazy stuff and like I want you know I've had people come up to me before I would like really knew what I was doing with the corals and they're like what happened to this snake and they like show me a picture of it and it's just like this insane pink and orange animal and I was just like <laughs> I had no idea that one was going to do that. I sold you that for $200. Now I'm pissed. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. That's insane. Yeah. I mean, good for them, but I've, I've definitely learned. Right. That's, that's the thing about, uh, about breeding snakes too. It's, and especially with boas, it's all the waiting game. Like it takes longer to wait for them to grow out and then it takes longer for them to wait to grow into everything else. It's definitely, uh, definitely a passion project oh for sure yeah <clears throat> so um i was gonna say i'm trying i'm trying to I'm, I'm working my way through all the different things that i want to kind of poke your brain out about <laughs> a lot of this stuff so yeah, sure um mostly what you do with like like we kind of talked before is a lot of like the coral um and the call stuff is there any other fun projects that you mess with as far as just the emperor artists go uh not too much um we do have the nfis which stand for no freaking idea um no that's kidding. a totally separate line of albino that popped out uh five six years ago now um i was working at joe's and i had the striped albino or the striped head albino that i was so excited about and like she's getting up to size to breed and i was like man i really need a, a male for this animal so I decided to, because um, back like towards the end of when I was working there, like I was pretty much in charge of all the breeding. Like I paired everything up. I decided who went with who. Like I, I did most of the care. Um, and so I was like, well, I'm going to put this stripe with a coral so I can make some full striped coral albinos. And I did that and we hadn't outcrossed the stripe line at all. And when I did that, we've got these 
weird looking brown and green albinos that almost didn't look albino out of the litter huh. and it, it kind of backfired because i didn't get any coral stripes out of it because obviously they all turned into holdbacks but it also didn't backfire because i had my own stripe and so obviously joe was like are you do you want to sell me the stripe back and i was like absolutely not <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so i bred mine and i made my own nfis and last year i crossed it into leopard so i've made nfis het leopard and now i'm growing them up to hopefully make some nfi leopards and nfi eclipses within the next you know two or three years but um basically you know like 15 years ago or more joe got two striped animals from two completely unrelated striped animals because he wanted to make a full striped albino and he bred them together he got 32 babies and he got one weird looking like strange albino out of the whole litter and which is obviously super weird and so obviously he kept that and he bred it back into the stripes just to make stripes het cow because he thought it was just a weird he got a weird you know cow litter and he wasn't making cow albinos he was just making more stripes so we uh he bred the two to get together again that made that one weird albino same thing he got like 30 something you know stripes and then he got one paradox albino but then that paradox didn't make it past his first shed unfortunately yeah. So he just kind of kept like breeding them together and trying to like repeat that pairing and make more, but he hadn't tried outcrossing the stripes at all yet. Hmm. So that was part of the reason I was like, I'm going to outcross them. Like we've been breeding them together for too long. Like we're just making more stripes that we don't know what to do with. And that's when it produced that NFI that we've been calling it. So he just bred the first visual females this year, NFI to NFI. And she's gravid. He bred his to an IMG this year. So he's going to get a lot of cool NFIs. Um, he bred a NFI to a, a visual NFI to a striped pet for NFI. And it does look like there's some kind of weird super form with it, which is pretty cool. So I'm excited to see the NFI to NFI breeding. But the whole, like, I don't want to harp on them too long because we'll be here talking about it all night because it, it makes no sense how the gene <laughs> works it makes zero sense we've talked to everybody about it jeff ronnie chris gilbert tom burke before he passed like they all have no idea they <laughs> we're all just at a loss it seems like every time we try to do a breeding to get answers we get more questions so like at this point i'm just kind of taking a step back and having fun with it like whatever but <laughs> whatever it makes it makes but it's a That's very confusing morph to say the least. <clears throat> really interesting. I'm I need to I need to go like have you posted a lot of pictures of those? Because I absolutely want to take a look at those at some point. Cause Yeah, I just posted a bunch. If you're going to Tinley, Joe's gonna be there and he's got a bunch on his table. So oh, that's cool. going to be your best bet at seeing them because the pictures don't really pick up and everybody will, will agree the pictures do not pick up the true colors that they have. And it's another animal where like as it ages it gets better and better, like they literally have green all over them, you know, like how many boas have that. So it's just a, a really cool animal. I hope he brought like a, an older one, which he usually does. So you can like truly see what they turn into. <clears throat> and that's, I don't have a whole lot of cash, but I'm going to be at that little fry meme. Just take my money. <laughs> yeah, he'll be, he'll be there for sure. He's a JPC boas. Definitely go find the NFIs. Oh, yeah, that's so cool. I, I like that, like, just kind of, like, weird stuff that just shows up, and you're like, what the heck is this? And no yeah, one knows it what makes that no is. Sense. Like, I have I, a video on my Instagram, like, basically explaining in depth of everything we know and, like, some of the theories that I have, like, if you ever want to go look at it. But, like I said, we'll, we'll be here all night talking about it and start getting into it. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I originally found you just because of your, uh, originally it was the groovy call stuff, and then I used to, like, I started looking at your rainbow boas and your and the lava stuff. I was like, holy crap, I need to, I need to, I need to just talk to this guy because he knows he must know a whole lot more than me, number one. And then number two, he just works with some really cool <laughs> stuff. So that's really fun. Um I did have a question for you. I don't know if you really mess with it a lot, but I think you probably because I know you've been doing boas longer than I have, certainly. Um, when you talked about the paradox um that just kind of popped up. Have you had any sort of like lineage with that? Like I know some people have popped out 
not every litter, but fairly consistently from pairings, paradoxes that will pop up. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, it's obviously a, a random gene, like you can't, there's no het for it, there's no, no making more, but we definitely, Joe has a bunch that he can breed together and almost always make at least one or two paradoxes in his litter. And the NFI stuff is constantly throwing paradoxes. Like he's got tons of paradoxes from the NFI litter, which is really cool. Um, Scott CV, the guy with all the Kraken and, and uh, lava stuff where it originated from, was the same thing. He had pairs that he could throw together and get a paradox almost every time. So I don't really know what the the science or logic is behind it. Right. Um, I have yet to produce a paradox and it's driving me absolutely insane. Uh, <laughs> I like have all the, you know, the ingredients from the people who make paradoxes and I just keep striking out every time. And but I'm hoping next time, next year, when I breed my uh, NFI girl, I can hopefully get some paradoxes out of it, but oh, I have a- horrible luck. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm just always kind of really curious about it. Cause like I know, um, like in ball pythons, they throw um, not consistently, but like the same pairings will throw them very often as well. So I was just curious because mm-hmm. I've only ever seen a couple pictures and one other person who had um, twisted genetics. Um, Ron had one that was um, just a straight split of like black on one side and then like um, a really high contrast ghost on the other side. It was really cool. That's and awesome. I was just kind of yeah. curious because I just I don't know so that's really really cool yeah i love paradoxes for sure and then you've been doing uh mostly just the brazilian rainbow bows yep yeah i only have the 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 high red brazilians um not super interested in the morphs i mean the pied would be pretty cool and i think the stripe ones are pretty cool but honestly i just i think nothing beats like a super red you know normal wild type brazilian like that's what i'm all about Absolutely. Uh, there's, I know we, we get into the morphs a lot, but sometimes just those wild types, those really nice animals are just kind of the best. Um, yeah. I know a lot of people, when they see that, they want to get into rainbow boas. Um, how is your care differences and breeding and pairing them up differ from the emperor otters? Like I know a little bit, but. Yeah, it's not too much different. Um, they definitely like it a little colder, just like baseline all the time. Um, than the imperators do and obviously the humidity is like a big factor like I'll just put like a giant tub of water over the heat pad basically or like over half the heat pad Um, especially if they're in like cages and stuff just to help keep it up or like throw sphagnum moss in there and like a big bowl of water Um, and a lot of times they'll like go in there and breed actually which is like kind of weird to me but you know whatever (laughs) whatever gets it done I guess like they breed in the water yeah yeah, I've seen, so it. I've seen cool. him do it a few times. Uh, the guy I got them from, Ike Leitner, just posted a picture of his doing it too. Oh, I but, okay. um Yeah, so a lot of it is just, um, I, I I prefer the sphagnum moss in water, but um, I hate the mess that comes along with sphagnum moss. So a lot there. of times I'll just do like a big water bowl in there. That's really cool. I was just, I always think that's really cool because I know they're, they're more closely related technically, technically, technically to anacondas than like the imperators in the in the bcs mm-hmm. but they're not aquatic at all they're always they're fairly they're arguably more arboreal than than the other ones. Oh, yeah. so, as they love to climb so it's just always really interesting because i don't know too too much about them so that's why i was like oh cool i can ask about those rainbows too um do you pair them the There's... same time of year yep yeah i pair everything the same time of year um i usually start cooling down uh in september october slowing down the meals and stuff like that and by november i've got everything cooled all the way down and paired up um i usually try to keep everything paired until uh like around this time or april or so but it started getting so warm here i just didn't really have a choice anymore so i've pulled everything probably two three weeks ago cool that's really fun i actually (laughs) gets to the next question i was going to ask is um I know a lot of boa people that will rely almost like they'll take a retic method and just kind of like pump them full of food and that really triggers them. And they've had a lot of success with that versus um, the traditional cooling period. So I was going to ask, cause I know you've been very successful exactly how you pair those up. Um, yeah, I think with those, especially less food is more 
Mm-hmm. Um, I hardly feed it all over winter. Uh, the babies I feed maybe monthly and the big stuff will get like two or three meals between October and April. Um, sometimes the males will get a little more if they're getting skinny. Like I'll definitely pull them out and give them an extra meal. But I really only use the meals on the females to try and trigger an ovulation. Um, a lot of times, like if not much is happening or like the female just wants to eat when the male's trying to breed her like crazy, I'll pull the male and give them a smaller meal than I normally would. And it'll do a, a good job of triggering an ovulation. Um, that just happened with my uh, lava line coral. Uh, two weeks ago, actually, she I thought she had ovulated because she was going into shed um because i gave her a meal a week before that and so i was like oh perfect she's all good and then in the middle of her shed she had a, a huge ovulation so i i totally misread it and i couldn't believe it because i've never ever seen a boa shed or uh have an ovulation in shed before and i've only talked to one other person who's had that happen so it was it was pretty weird for sure and she definitely threw me for a loop on that one but and i didn't have the mail in there because i fed her so i'm hoping that that she's still going to have a good litter out of it, but well, we'll see I, in uh, I mean, four months. <laughs> yeah. Not, not to knock your chances, but it happened to me with my female Doomerals boa. Like I've had the worst luck with anybody with Doomerals for the longest time. Like I had the pair for about four years and then I gave the pair to somebody else who had successfully bred quite a few different um, species. I was like, here you go. He had them for five years and they didn't do anything yeah. for him. And I got him back we moved it's a lot colder down here and now she's actually ovulated with the male and it looks like she's starting to build um oh, that's good but the very first time that i did pair them up that's what happened is i thought she was going into a pre-ovulation shed and she ovulated in the middle of shed while the male was out and then reabsorbed oh uh, no so hopefully you know knock on wood yeah but that doesn't <laughs> happen to you she definitely doesn't look like she's reabsorbing, but she did. When I bred her two years ago, she had kind of a crappy litter. So I really wanted the male to be in there. And I threw him in during the ovulation just because, you know, why not? And he did try and lock up with her, but obviously she didn't have much interest. Yeah, that's that's good. Do you try to keep your um, males significantly smaller than your females? Um, It's... Yeah, it's not like a really uh, intentional thing, I guess. I just don't, yeah, I don't know. I guess I don't feed them quite the same as I do the females. Uh, I never give a male anything larger than a small rat. My biggest male is probably three and a half feet or so. Okay. But I also have like a a different uh, kind of feeding method than most people. Like my biggest female is only seven and a half feet. And she's she's a big girl, and her, her parents were big, so I kind of expected that out of her. But the majority of my females are five feet or less. I mean, that's a lot of my stuff is like CA and CAT paws. And so I have like a five-year-old mm-hmm. female that next year will be the first time. So she'll be six when I pair her for the first time. And she's right at five-ish feet, still yeah. pretty thin. So this summer, I'm going to probably feed her more than I normally would, um, especially for a CA. But yeah. yeah. But yeah, that's, I know that's something that a lot of people um, don't think about. They always expect like it's a monster seven, eight foot, you know, snake that pops out like 20, 30 babies, but that's not always the case. No, I mean, I I feed them, you know, appropriately, I think. Um, And a lot of times they just don't get as big. I find usually after they have their first litter, they -hmm. have like a little growth spurt after that. Um, But then, you know, they usually don't get much bigger. And I, I always wait till at least four years, um, sometimes five. But uh, yeah, it's just it's not it's not necessary. I think I think a, a lot of people and even like mainstream bigger breeders just overfeed. Well, and I, so yeah. you may be getting decent sized litters out of it, but you're not going to get longevity, or you're not doing really what's best for the animals. <clears throat> Same with like the people that are breeding back to back year after year, not getting any years off, like. It's not good for them. And especially if they're having slugs, like that's really bad for their birthing tract, you know, like passing slugs. So it's just, it's, it's not right. And I'm I'm pretty big on like trying to do what's best for the animal. I think, I think unfortunately a lot of it is like a lot of the big ball python people, like 
moved from colubrids that a lot of times would just like double clutch on their own sometimes. And so they yep. kept that mentality of ball pythons and they don't give them a break. Like they'll be power feeding them as soon as they lay eggs and have them go the next year. And so I think a lot of people just kind of carry that mentality over to boas when I have a hard time telling people like, yeah, my babies get fed like once every two weeks, man. Like, yeah. I don't know. It's not every five, seven days. It's like 10 to 14, if not more. Like, just I mean, I totally get, get that mindset, you know, maybe like 10, 15 years ago. And like, you just didn't know, like, you know, people were feeding the crap out of ball pythons and they were eating. So like, why not do it to boas? Like they'll eat whenever they want, they'll eat till they're puking and dead, you know? But, um, I think nowadays like there's enough information and like people talk about it enough where like if you're doing it like you're doing it to make money or just try and breed them quick and it's just like it's just disappointing to see still I think <clears throat> yeah I mean that's that's a whole tangent that I a lot of times end up going down the road with people that I have on here just talking about you know all about the money and chasing that next morph and you know, all that stuff like you know the original img girl and all that other jazz so oh yeah but whatever may have you on that one um so i know that you'd um how long have you been breeding the rainbow bows not to that's kind of a long loop around again but i just don't know as much about rainbows so um i just they're newer um i've only bred the female once and mm-hmm. she's got this year off so i'll be breeding her next season and then i have i only have a trio of them and then i have another like super super red female that i got from ike she's 2018 so she might breed next season but they they grow a lot slower than i was expecting um i went into them pretty blind i was just like every time I go to, you know, it was something like I wanted, but never really thought about like every show, everybody's asking if I have them, if I have them, do I know anyone that has them? So it's like, all right, people want these. I want these, like, I'm going to get a pair. (laughs) And I got a pair and just like absolutely fell in love with them because before the only exposure I really had to them was at that reptile shop I worked at. And they were always just like these mean nippy ones that, and I was just (laughs) like, I hate the, you know, like, I don't want to deal with this. Like I'm getting bit and they like strike to the side and they don't really give you a lot of warning before they do it. That's Um, that. Yeah. I I just didn't want to deal with it. And then like the ones I got from Ike were just like puppy dogs. Hey, you know, like when my niece and nephews come over, like those are the first ones I pull out. Cause like, I know they're not going to bite. They just want to explore and check stuff out um so yeah i'm pretty new to them uh as well i've only had them for six years five six years now i mean it's but um they're fun i was gonna say did you notice um i was talking to another rainbow breeder um did they have that kind of like weird growth spurt in like two years not really they've been pretty slow growing for me uh there was like one point where i start like she like was i didn't feel like she was growing at all and so I hit her with like some larger meals and then she kind of looked like she was starting to get fat. So then I just backed off again and I've just been feeding them slow. You know, like my oldest female, she's a 2016 uh, and she's still, you know, medium rats. And then they still leave like a little lump in her and stuff. So they just, they're slow growers. So I just take them slow. Okay, that's really At cool. At least in, in my experience. Okay. I was just, like I said, I don't know too much about it. So every time that I have a chance to talk, somebody who works with them. I always got to ask a couple of questions here and there. Um, yeah, yeah, of course. And, I mean, just the fact that you said you've only been working with them for five, six years, that probably says a lot when that's longer than a lot of people even stay in the hobby period. <laughs> yeah, that's and, true. A lot of fly by nighters. Yeah. That's, you know, it's that, you know, that thing before that we kind of said about ball pythons best and worst it's you now yeah. everyone thinks they can get right into it and it's quick and, you know, they forget just how much of a waiting game it is, how much of a commitment it is, how much money goes into all the caging and feeding and lighting. Oh, yeah. and you're not want to be a jerk about it. So it's, yeah, especially with boas too. That's a lot. Yeah. Hurry up and wait. Yeah. <laughs> Don't I know it about that? Um, and so you said that your doom rolls are probably going to go next year. So you haven't read those yet? No, not yet. Okay. Um, my girlfriend's had this female doom rolls for like 
I think she's 10 or 11 now. Mm -hmm. And she's just like never, you know, like before she met me, like she just had a couple and they were just pets. And then like, obviously with me, she definitely snowballed a little bit, but um, she's always wanted to breed her. And she seems like she always wants to breed because she goes off food and gets like all, you know, like, like bumps you off and stuff. It doesn't really want to be touched in winter and likes to get cooled down. So I think she's going to be a good breeder. And I got uh, a mail from Jason Ramondi uh, two years ago and he's growing like a weed. Oh my gosh. I can't believe how big he's gotten. So I think he'll definitely be ready to go uh, this coming fall. Cool. That's really cool. I like that. That's, yeah. I don't see a whole lot of doomerel boas or anything like that around. So one of these days I'm going to find somebody who messes with Madagascar uh, ground boas. Um, yeah. Other than nerd. Um, I was going to say, that's the only place I've seen that has them. There was, I mean, like back, you know, like 10 years ago when I first kind of got into this, somebody had a pair before, like they completely dipped off the face of the earth. And it was like, I think probably, I think they only wanted like 1300 or something for the pair. But oh, wow. I mean, 10 years ago, I was like 20 years old. That's a lot of money for a 20 year old. So yeah, it's a lot of money now, man. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's very true. I can't really argue with that, but when I'm sitting there looking at like spider ball pythons at the same time, I'm like, I can't do that. <laughs> oh, the things that we learn in hindsight. Yep. Oh man. So, um, is this season starting to kind of rock out to be a pretty good one for you? Um, it's, it's about average. I really only pair, you know, about five a year. Okay. Um, this is the first year that I haven't been able to get one of them gravid and it's driving me insane. Cause like, usually <laughs> like I, I breathe a small amount, like for a couple of reasons, but one of them is I can keep like a really close eye on them and like judge very well what's happening. Um, and I just, she would not do it no matter what I, I couldn't you know I had her very cold I had no food around the male was like relentless on her and all she wanted to do was eat she had no and she's bucking him off all the time like just no interest whatsoever and the male is just he was getting too skinny you know I was pulling him and feeding him putting him back pulling feed him put him back and like it was just too much for him and I was like I don't want to you know risk losing this guy so I ended up pulling him plus it was getting too warm up here anyways but I was just dumbfounded and like, I can't figure her out. Like I might just like try and breed her in the middle of summer or something. Like I have no <laughs> idea what her cycle is, but yeah, all four of the ones, uh, all the four others are gravid that Coral just got gravid, you know, two weeks ago, she's in her PLS right now and she's still freaking huge and sitting on the heat. And, uh, the other three all ovulated on the same day. So that's going to be a fun week for me, uh, in mid April. <laughs> Uh, I'm assuming they're all going to drop a day apart just to make my life miserable, but we'll see. Yeah, that's always fun. And it's, it, it makes me wonder if that's the reason why people just like food cycle more than cold because of like what you have going on with your female. Like if, if that's no, the, like, yeah, like that's why they choose to do it. And that way they can have like babies in the winter versus babies oh, the gotcha. for like the early shows. And they just like, they just keep their rooms the same temps and they just pump them full of food. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe most just weird stuff. I, 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 I rely on like the, the outside temperatures a lot though for my breeding. So mm -hmm. like, I don't, I don't know if that would work out super well for me, but who knows? True. But just I guess, I mean, just I guess the way well, I've done it. Yeah. I guess now that I think about it, a lot of people I talk to are like SoCal and like Florida area people. So that's not, as much but i mean you have a lot of like the old school people have been doing it for a long time up there in the northeast huh yeah yeah there's a decent amount and there's just some people there, some pretty large collections too <clears throat> that's gonna say that's really cool i was gonna i was gonna say how's the i don't know too much about um the community up there outside of like nerd um is it a pretty decent reptile community in that whole kind of like my brain, because, you know, Colorado, it's the size of a good chunk of the Northeast. So it's like all a big conglomerate. Um, yep. Is there a good, a good reptile community out there? Yeah, there really is. Uh, the shows are always, you know, absolutely packed. Like they always sell out. Like you can't walk around at them very easily because there's so many people there. 
um i i can never really leave my booth and check stuff out these days anymore just because like there's always somebody there um obviously covid kind of rocked it a little bit but it's a it's a surprisingly big community um i was definitely surprised like my first reptile show i went to and i was young like just how many people were there like i thought it was just going to be like a little room with a couple vendors but you know it's full arenas or gymnasiums or whatever just packed with reptiles that's really cool i like that yeah it's like I said, it's ball python pit out here. So you're hard pressed yeah. to find anything that's on a ball python or honestly like a tarantula in the summer. Um, yeah, so there's, there's definitely a lot of ball pythons out here. Um, well, yeah. there's, there's net bug, which is in Connecticut too. And they have like thousands and thousands of spiders and all kinds of other bugs and stuff, which is pretty right. cool. Um, and then there's also like a, a decent amount of boa breeders around. Um, a lot of them are kind of like, more my size or like a little bit bigger but um like jpc has ton he does like you know 50 pairs a year sometimes so i mean that's yeah I, I was he's gonna definitely say it's, busy it's hard to do big with boas just because of how the animal is unless you have a lot of space and time and help yeah yep for sure cool that's really fun um i was gonna say i know that you've been talking now I'm going to switch to a little bit more serious, unfortunately. Um, I know that you've been a, a big pusher for like, you know, all the animal laws that are being pushed through right now. And I know Connecticut has the same one that's been on the books for like five other states, even including Colorado over the last few years. And it's that same copy and paste nonsense. Mm -hmm. Like it's literally the exact same bill, the exact same word. It's just in every single one. Have you been getting any traction with like the reptile community up there to like really back you guys or is it just a whole lot of internet yeah and then nobody actually shows up like I'm I was out that's why I was kind of asking about the reptile community out there like do people actually you know put their money where their mouth is so to speak yeah uh it was I was a little bit disappointed honestly with this last hearing um I know there was a couple people that got like booted out of the zoom and stuff and like couldn't get back in or like they were just kind of denying people talking in there for whatever reason, like saying it was full or something like that. So there was like a lot of people that were for the bill in that room and they were kind of for it for all the wrong reasons that they didn't understand. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it was very frustrating and it was like four and a half hours of just like, going back and forth kind of everyone making the same points over and over um but I, it seems like especially because like nerd is here and they're like so loud and vocal with it that people do step up um you know i was like i remember back way back when i remember hr 669 which was yep. like after the uh basically after the chimpanzee attack which was in connecticut too like mm -hmm. they were trying to just ban all exotics and like I was in middle school at the time and I remember, you know, writing to my senators and stuff. I had like my history teacher in school helping me do it. And like people wow. really came together and it was just like an awesome thing to see. And I don't know if it's just cause like I was little and it just seemed like it was more people at the time or what, but it, it seems like people are kind of getting, uh, a little like almost like numb or like too relaxed to all the bills because there's just so many now like it's it's very tiring to like you know i'm constantly like emailing you know leaving voicemails trying to advertise on instagram keep, keep people informed and things like that and like i'm also taking care of a bunch of snakes you know my iguana and working a full-time job and trying to you know be with family you know do things that i want to do outside of the reptile community so like it just gets to be a little exhausting for sure. Mm -hmm. And like, I understand like people not wanting to invest a lot of time, energy into it, but like you have to, you know, yeah. like it's, it's not going to be there if we don't. And um, this one is just like, it's so messed up. You know, it's uh, Phil Goss was in the meeting for Musark and he made a, a, an excellent point, which is very true. It's like, the, the zoos and the aquariums, things like that, do a great job of educating at their facility, but they're not the ones going out to classrooms or to birthday parties or to college campuses to educate. Like that's people like us. And like, I'm not, I'm not hardly an educator. Like I don't go do birthday parties or things like that. Like it's just at this point, I, I used to do it when I worked at the reptile shop quite a bit. 
Um, and it was, it was something I enjoyed doing, but I just don't really have the animals for it. Um, but it's, yeah, yeah. it's just so important. I mean, there's so many people that like I've, you know, inspired just for letting them touch a snake and like, and then they became regulars at the shop or, you know, we became friends on Facebook or whatever. And, and now like they're super passionate and I have their own pets and things like that. And like, that's the kind of stuff that like keeps the hobby going. Like I was mentioning, uh, on one of my lives, like my nephew, like finally just got his first crested gecko and he's so excited about it. And like telling all his classmates about it. And like, if, if he can't get any more, it's going to be crushed. You know, I mean, those things don't live forever, you know, and his parents are don't want a snake in the house, obviously, and they don't want him to get any more right now. So, like, I don't want that to be the only interaction he gets to have with a reptile. And so, like, I've just we, we need to think about the future. Yep. And we also need to think about our native wildlife. Like, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to that have no idea that there's rattlesnakes in Connecticut. They had no clue. And they're so endangered. Like it's, it's ridiculous. They're so endangered because they've been so persecuted and there's been so much habitat lost for them and we have to protect them. Like we have to do everything we can. And I can always get people to a point where, you know, they're at least not going to kill a snake if they see it just, Mm -hmm. just by talking to them, showing them snakes and things like that. But if people don't know, they're not going to care or try and protect it. I mean, what you can't save what you don't know, or you don't care about what you don't know. So we have to like inspire and keep people involved in this stuff so we can keep our native wildlife around. Yep. That's, that's exactly right. That's what I always like to tell people. Like it all starts with a spark somewhere. And if people don't know about Mm -hmm. it, how can you expect them to care? Like you said, and I know because I, I end up kind of branching out a little bit and I go, a little outside the hobby to like people who do like conservation work and who are biologists and do stuff like that a lot of them have the same like we a lot of us have the same backstory of well you know I got a garter snake or a box turtle and that's where it started Mm -hmm. a lot of them are that weird dude usually with a weird hat and a big yellow (laughs) snake showed up at my school or library or boy scout troop or whatever and that's the spark and then they end up being um you know a guy who tracks wolf and elk populations in yellowstone like that's where it started and it's that unfortunate thing that you know they don't i mean it real realistically the the end goal is no animals period so it's not it's not that they don't care about it it's that it doesn't matter it's not even in the conversation it's no more that's it period despite um you know all the good that can come from what we've already destroyed trying to go back which is just yeah. terrible but um so there we go that was my little i always try I always try to do a little bit of a u.s arc or something like that into all the different podcasts every time i can talk because again if you don't know about it how can you expect to care so yeah um but with that being said um just to throw some stuff out there, just kind of like little fun stuff. So that way we don't end on such a terrible note. Um, I mean, it's not a bad note, but, you know, it's a bit of a downer. Um, if you could pick one snake out of your collection to be like your, this is my Everest here, or like a goal that you're going to try to make, what would you be? I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot here a little bit. I probably should have said that before. It would probably be uh, the coral that I, one of the corals that I made from last year's uh, coral litter from the groovy coral to the uh, lava line. She's nuts. Like I post her, I post her on my page all the time. She's absolutely insane. She's like just so saturated and her head's like bone white with like these pink flecks on it. And every shed, she gets a few more flecks on it. But um, like in the morning when she's all fired up, she's like almost purple down by her tail and along her That's sides. So cool. Like she's so cool. And she's had anery. So I'm really curious to see what moon glows and snows from her are going to look like. Like I hope they have that greenish and yellow tint to them and stuff like that. But she's one of the most, probably like the animal I'm most excited I produced last year. That's so cool. I know that like you just do some crazy stuff. Like I know everybody does like the VPI and everybody does like eclipses and, you know, RDRs and stuff, but um, like the stuff that you are doing is just really, really cool. And it's just amazing to look at 
Um, do you end up getting like a lot of requests? Like do you end up having to do wait lists and stuff? I did wait lists for a while with corals and then I kind of said no more because I was, just got tired of it. It's just like, yeah, I don't like chasing people down for things. Um, and I, so it's just like everything I produce is on Instagram or Morph Market. Like everyone have a pick at it, you know, I'm not like, <laughs> secretly like you know in my inbox like okay i'll hold this one for you but like don't tell anybody you know it's just here it is if you want it you come get it kind of thing um but i do have like everybody wants a coral and like that's why i was like so trying to get this female coral to produce because this is the second year i've done a coral to coral but it's the first year i've done a visual albino uh lavas together so they'll be double double dose t positive lavas and she's my biggest girl she's seven and a half feet so i'm really hoping to get a decent sized litter out of her but again even if i do it's going to be a solid year before i sell any so. right exactly <laughs> yeah it's just it's just a, a waiting game but yeah people are always trying to get corals and i i wish i had more to give i just don't you know, a lot of them, I do a visual albino to head albinos. So I'm only getting, you know, mm -hmm. four, five, six, like, actual corals out of a litter. Well, I kind of like that pairing anyway. Like, I don't, I don't like to do close family trees and recesses as much as possible. So, yeah. But that's really cool. So, well, I'm rooting for you because uh, I will absolutely be one of those people that or one of these days will be knocking on your door at some point. <laughs> but for sure I mean, it's, you know doing a whole lot more it's as you said before it's very taxing and time consuming and then you know stuff gets forgotten and stuff gets you know misplaced and you don't want that to be an animal so right but cool um well that's kind of all i really had i tried to then i try to keep these fairly short like you know right around an hour or so just because i don't like to take too many people's time but yeah I mean that was really cool I like I just I like talking to other boa people in general I don't really get a whole lot of chance to do so yeah no it's fun just going back and forth with other reptile people for sure cool that's really fun as well um I mean that's really all I got so if people are interested um in checking you out or you know starting to get save up their money for a really cool lava groovy line coral uh where can they find you uh, best place is Instagram. Uh, my username is Noah's Boas with the number one at the end um, or Morph Market as well. It's just Noah's Boas on there. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It was. Really yeah, thanks great. for having me. I'm glad that, uh, you know, I've, I have a hard time tracking people down, unfortunately. So yeah, I, I really do appreciate that. Herding cats. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's definitely true. <laughs> Cool. Well, thank you again. And I hope everybody enjoyed today's podcast. If you can uh, watch, you know, if you're hearing this, um, go check out the YouTube where you can see the video of us talking as well as plenty of other um, reptile content. Probably not as much bow stuff as I should, but we're working on that down the line. Um, hope you're having a great day and we will check you next time.